okay good day guys i hope everyone is doing okay today i just wanted to speak on an interview that i recently saw with reggae boy marlon king or with former reggae boy marlon king and i just wanted to give my reactions to this interview which was done on the coach's desk youtube channel so I'm just going to break it down and basically add my two cents. You know, this is the second interview that I have reviewed or analyzed. And I really wanted to speak on it because of one who was being interviewed and the mere fact that it was a very good interview because of the insight given into the inner workings of the JFF, right? Especially coming from a former player. I also want to speak on it because it is a very interesting take from the perspective of an overseas based player, more specifically a player that was born overseas. And you know, it's not too often that we get to hear from these players, especially from a Marlon King, one so loved by us here in Jamaica. Because the fact of the matter is, Marlon King has always been a fan favorite. I would even argue he could be Jamaica's most loved overseas born player. Because Jamaica for many reasons, always took a liking to Marlon King. But separate and apart from Marlon King being a fan favorite, the fact of the matter is that we do rarely hear from these overseas born players on an extended basis. They always do very short interviews at the airport. And in my opinion, there has always been a distance between them and fans. At least that's how I feel anyways. Because in all fairness, we don't really know them. Fact is, they just pop in and out for games. And of course, social media and the internet has helped to bridge this gap and has facilitated interviews of this sort. Interviews on a more personal level. And there is also Instagram as well that can bring us into the world of these players. Especially interviews like this where former players are really speaking on their experience and relationship with the JFF is also very rare. You will hear past players make a not so flattering comment regarding the JFF and say something along the lines of they need to step up their game. But it's rare when you hear from a former player really detailing their experience with the Federation. If it has happened any at all. It's only in recent times, especially since the leaked audio, I have seen past players starting to voice their frustrations and expound and these frustrations in television interviews. A player like Ricardo Fuller comes to mind. But an in-depth interview with Marlon of this nature and length really gives us a deep dive. And by the way, I remember Luton Shelton, God rest his soul, in a GPS interview a couple of years ago said, he was going to return to GPS to do a tell-all and expose the JFF and its shenanigans. But of course, sadly, this never happened. So firstly, regarding Marlon King's interview, let me just say it was really good to hear the passion from Marlon. And to be honest with you, I can't say I'm surprised by this. Marlon always struck me as being very passionate about playing for Jamaica. And this is quite evident in his impressive goal scoring record for Jamaica. Right? 
I also was very happy to hear the baller speak on his business dealings in real estate and construction post his career. Cause you know a number of the players make all this money only to end up eventually squandering it. So that was really good to hear. It was also very interesting though hearing him speak from the perspective of an overseas born player. A perspective that we rarely get to hear and one that is not widely touted because most of the opinions you hear are local based and it's especially rare to hear one speaking on the resistance from some regarding their arrival as you know that there has always been a divide surrounding players that were born overseas and are eligible to represent the country through familial ties. He expressed frustrations at a common sentiment of resentment shared by many Jamaicans as it relates to overseas born players playing for Jamaica, labeling it an ignorant view, saying that Jamaica needed to accept the ability and quality of whether it's the player or the coach that can advance the team. Now, while I understand and to a large extent share this view, I do think that this view, and especially the way Marlon put it, is a bit one-sided. I will speak on this further. I must say though I don't agree with his comparisons in the interview to Mario Balotelli with Italy and his reference to the French and German national teams as an argument to show acceptance. When Marlon says that France are World Cup winners because they know how to embrace outside influence, I don't necessarily agree with the word embrace. The way I see it, it is more like using and not fully embracing. The fact of the matter is that it can be argued that Mario Balotelli has to this day not been accepted in Italy. You know and some people, even he himself if I'm not mistaken, have boiled it down to racism. That his non-acceptance in Italy is solely based on race. Mesut Ozil as well. Upon his retirement from the German national team, claimed that he felt as though he has never been accepted because you guys know he was not born in Germany. And the fact of the matter is, to label it an arrogant view, in my opinion, it was a little bit unkind to us Jamaicans. While I do understand what he means by this, the fact is Jamaica is not alone. There are similar sentiments among the general populace in other countries around the world about players not being born in those respective countries but competing for them. But to be honest with you, I myself have had some reservations when it comes to non-Jamaican born players representing Jamaica. I can't lie to you. There have been times when I do question their commitment to the nation. Whether they are patriotic enough. And I do think that this is a legitimate concern, right? And this feeling is because oftentimes Jamaica is their second or even third choice. Jamaica is really and truly not where their heart is or not the country that they really want to play for. Oftentimes this country they really want to play for is England and the simple truth of the matter being they are just not good enough to make the grade. Now let's be honest here guys, can you imagine the disappointment of not being able to fulfill your dream? 
sometimes in some cases your childhood dream is it unreasonable for well-thinking jamaicans to think that after this disappointment of not being able to embark on your first or even second choice that there might be a feeling from the respective player of disappointment and a feeling of settling for less begrudgingly so i think many jamaicans look at it from this perspective and say to themselves it does not matter how many other countries i could be eligible to play for if i was a professional footballer i will always choose jamaica so i do think it rubs people the wrong way when it seems as if we have to be begging these players to come and play for us or when we see that they are giving themselves time to see if they can be good enough to make the grade for england and when they realize that they can't make it for england that's when they choose to come and play for jamaica now with that being said you do have countless examples of those who come and do well but you also have countless examples of those who come and underperform and you can see that their heart is not really in it simon preston reggae boys authority simon preston even alluded to this in a recent live that some of the overseas based players especially during the Schaefer era he felt were not committed and I'm not quoting him word for word but it was basically along those lines and of course you have the exceptions like Makanov and Mariapa who did brilliantly for us and by the way on a side note speaking of Makanov in my opinion he should have played more centrally than on the wing thought he had a greater impact for us in his few appearances playing as a number 10 anyways that's another story for another day right but the moral of the story is that there are times when i do question the desire and whether or not they will want to fight on the field for the desired result and have that extra push and desire that i do think patriotism provides and i question whether their heart is in it and where their loyalties lie and i'm not the only one right fact is this is a similar sentiment that is shared by a number of people in the country and it also does kind of make me feel a way when the anthem are play and the English born players can't sing it because the fact of the matter is them don't know it. My thing is at least put a little effort in the thing and go learn the anthem no man. Right? It's not that hard to learn. But overall the fact of the matter is it is for the overseas based players to come and prove themselves to us through their performances so while i accept marlon's perspective and it is a very valid one as well no doubt about it i do think it's a bit unkind to dismiss our sentiments entirely because i do think not trusting overseas born players is a real issue and one that is founded in logic marlon was also speaking from the perspective of if it's going to help the country why are we so averse to them coming now that is a very good point a very good point and a very valid valid point but the fact is a number of jamaicans are rightfully of the opinion that the overseas born players are at times opportunistic and that if your heart isn't in it you're not going to give of your best 
and some of them I personally don't feel their heart is in it and especially when you're talking about the national team. Right, the fact of the matter is there is a lot of patriotism involved. So it's reasonable to expect people to be very sensitive regarding the passion one emanates as a result of representing the country. Right? Marlon also spoke on a number of other topics from the perspective of an overseas born player pertaining to the reggae boys. One of the things he touched on was the risks overseas based players take when competing for the reggae boys. Even saying that for them to risk their club careers, it has to be worth it. Stating that when you are playing at a high level and you are earning high wages, it has to be something attractive. But what really struck a chord with me to be honest with you was what Marlon said about former national defender Naira Nasworthy and that entire incident involving him ripping his Achilles while playing for Jamaica in a World Cup qualifier. And of course, if you guys remember this incident, subsequently ended his career, unfortunately. He really emphasized the risk that especially overseas based players take when they represent the country. And it's something that truth be told I have always been saying for a, a long time. And truth be told, I don't think a lot of Jamaicans really realize this or saw things from that perspective. Hence, it's a point that must be highlighted, a very important point that must be highlighted. The fact is that these overseas based players put millions of pounds on the line and it can potentially be a big sacrifice, as unfortunately was the case for Nairon Nasworthy. And Nairon Nasworthy man was such a very good defender for us. You know, such a, a very good warrior. So that was, I remember that incident, man. It, it was very unfortunate and very sad. But it is also important to point out that the rewards for representing a country at the international level can be great. Right? We're talking about potential international silverware, like, for example, the upcoming Go Cup that Jamaica is trying to win, the prestige of being selected for a national team, as it does look good on your resume, and you know there's always the possibility of qualifying and playing in a World Cup, which of course looks really good on your CV. And all of this can facilitate a bump in your club salary as well. So, I'm sure all of this is a determining factor for those who choose to come and play for us. But still, it can be a big gamble, as Nasworthy learned the hard way. Marlon in the interview also shared stories, further highlighting the JFF's incompetence, if that is even possible to be further highlighted. Right, some truly shocking stories and we all know it is very hard to be surprised let alone shocked by the actions of the JFF. Right, I mean stories of players being given mattresses <laughs> to sleep on the floor, right, it's, it's funny I have to laugh, right, being given mattresses to sleep on the floor. And by the way, coach's reaction to this bombshell was just priceless. Man, trust me, it was just priceless to see the expression on his face when he heard what he was hearing. And Marlon also gave us a behind the scenes account of what took place in a training camp leading up to a 
Nigeria friendly some years ago where the players did not even have a ball to kick for the training camp right we're talking about players turning up to a national training camp right and no balls no training kits absolutely nothing trust me man sad sad man really really sad when you're giving international footballers some of them being millionaires mattresses to sleep on the floor this is just obviously unacceptable and can't this even potentially lead to players getting injured man i don't know right i i am no physician right and also basic schools have balls to train with right basic school with with kindergarten kids and you're telling me the jamaica football federation the governing body responsible for football in the entire country can't provide balls and training kits to train for an upcoming game marlon even went on to further state that he was the one that had to call and ask the kickman from his then club watford in london which was nearby to bring balls and kits to the training ground so that they could try to prepare for the upcoming game right now this is just embarrassing man this was truly the most shocking part of this interview marlon also addressed the incident that led to him being banned as well from international football and saying that it was punishment for him speaking up on behalf of especially local based players who were not in a position to speak up for them to be paid what they were owed and the sad reality of the matter is the JFF has not built up any leeway or enough confidence for us to be able to defend them against an accusation like this because the fact is we have heard these kinds of stories before the sad reality of the matter is it sounds exactly like something the jff would do and you know these are the sort of shenanigans that has led to a fractured relationship with past players like marlon and prevents the jff from being able to reach out to them for much needed assistance right we are talking about players who are in a position to add a lot of value to the national program through their vast wealth of experience at the highest level of football and their social capital and by that i mean contacts or links as we, we we would normally say in jamaica both of which the jff are in desperate need of when you hear simon preston who was a part of the interview saying that the jff needs to be more proactive in approaching overseas players and take a less lackadaisical attitude the fact is players like marlon has the connections on the ground to assist with this connections to a number of clubs in england many of whom he previously paid for where talents eligible to play for jamaica often pass through their academies and through their clubs young kids and teenagers in the academies of these respective clubs with jamaican heritage can be targeted from a very young age before they even blow up and even start to have realistic thoughts of playing for england right and also who is to tell if they won't be flattered by us being interested in them from an early age and later on in life if both countries are in pursuit the interest taken at an early age could potentially make choosing a lot less straightforward the fact is 
Marlon is in a position where he could play a major role in facilitating this. And he even alluded to this in the, in, in the interview. And his willingness to assist. But of course we all know the JFF's pride and ego will not allow them to go crawling back to a Marlon King. Now Marlon King did also make some slightly controversial comments that I want to speak a bit on. Right, controversial, slightly controversial comments on coach Tapa Whitmore that I, to be honest with you, I don't agree with. Stating that as much as I love Tapa, he is there because he abides to what they want and no disrespect to Tapa. But it's almost as if you have to be a puppet to get a role. On another occasion he also stated something along the lines of Jamaican football fans tolerate Tapa because he is a Jamaican legend. And that if it were not for that JA fans would be tired of him and he would be gone. Now I vehemently disagree with this notion of Tapa being a yes man and it's, it's, it's not new it's something we have heard before on a number of occasions right and because the fact of the matter is even if that was the case initially Tapa's record as reggae boys coach has certainly gained him a lot of clout Tapa's impressive record especially with what he has been given to work with is what has kept him in his job for this long and I will even take it a step further because in my opinion Tapa has been spearing the JFF's blushes. The fact is the underfield product during Tapa's reign has not been bad. Can you imagine if the reggae boys was performing like trash? In this day and age, when everybody is calling for the board to resign, they would have absolutely nothing to fall back on, right? And with a win percentage of 50% over a 100 game period, meaning that he has won 50 out of the 100 games he has coached the team. Guys, that is indeed brilliant, right? And... Historic victories over Mexico and the US is certainly a plus for Tapa. Marlon also spoke throughout the interview as well on the JFF needing to invest more money in the program. Now to be honest with you, it's not that I don't agree with this because while it is true that the Federation needs to invest more money, my question is, what money? Where is the Federation going to get the money from to invest? The fact of the matter is the Federation is incapable of brokering sponsorship deals with corporate entities because it is incapable of showing and facilitating the mutual benefits that can be extracted for both Federation and sponsor alike. It is incapable, right? Incapable of packaging the national program in a manner that is attractive. And last but certainly not least, it has a serious reputation of unprofessionalism and mishandling funds. And the only way they are going to get rid of this reputation is if they leave. This, of course, they are not prepared to do, right? So going forward, how is this federation going to attract sponsorship with this current board and president? The fact is, it will always struggle to attract sponsorship because the federation will always have this cloud over its head or this reputation because of this current board and in my opinion they will never be able to shake it. The fact is when they are changing voting laws to ensure they are always in power. 
Now, how do you think that looks to sponsors, right? Automatically, sponsors will have raised eyebrows because this indicates or implies corruption. And that is never a good sign when seeking to attract sponsorship. So when Marlon says invest more money, to be honest with you Marlon, that is really and truly a pipe dream. The fact is, we not having sponsors or having poor infrastructure has nothing to do with us being a third world nation in my opinion and everything to do with mismanagement and funds not being properly concentrated because of the poor way in which local football has been structured and governed, right? This ridiculous excuse about third world country, in my opinion, just needs to stop. It, it, it just needs to stop because it doesn't make any sense to me. Look at Uruguay, for example. They are a third world country with a little over 3 million people like us. And look at the players that they are able to produce. Right? Why we cannot produce players of a similar ilk and we always keep on having to run back to England for English leftovers. And that is no disrespect or offence to current English born players that represent the country. Right? That is just facts. Right? That is just facts. But all in all, it was a good and constructive reasoning that was held on coach's desk with Marlon, really and truly giving an in-depth synopsis on where the football in the country is and where it ought to be and what can be done to improve going forward. Especially from a perspective rarely heard from. And we encourage more of these discussions to take place especially especially involving past and esteemed professionals like a marlon king okay guys so that's my two cents regarding this interview that has taken place with marlon king so take care and until next time Oh, <laughs> oh,